after my sort of newbie R and D role, um, I moved into effects, um, and I did that for many years, um, mostly concentrating on fluid dynamics, and then uh, did some crowd simulation stuff, and uh, went into an effects supervisor role on Man of Steel, and then um, after that, I was I was keen to I was keen to kind of try out some of the other facets of the industry apart from effects. Um, and then by sort of happy, happy circumstance, um, Interstellar was in that super, super, super early pre-production stage. It hadn't been cast yet. Um, and there were conversations going on between um, Chris Nolan and Paul Franklin, who was the overall visual effects supervisor, where they were starting to talk about just what the film was going to be and it's still script still being written. Um, and at that point, um, uh, I was, I was freeing up from man of steel. And, um, so, uh, Paul and my, my boss, my head of head of CG at the time, um, Gav Graham kind of approached me and said, um, we want to do some concepts sort of 3d concepts about, um, the, a sort of physics based. So they have some kind of space time sort of swapping physical and temporal dimensions, sort of crazy, crazy ideas of sort of psychedelic ideas of, of, uh, physics ideas in, in CG. And actually it was all about the, the inside of the black hole at the end of the film at that point. Um, and so I came on to do that. Um, and I was working on that for a few months and then like over that time, um, effectively they asked if I wanted to be CG supervisor on it, which was awesome. Um, and I was very excited. I wasn't the only one. I worked with a guy called Dan Neal, who was fantastic. Um, so we together, uh, kind of worked on the film for then another year or so. Um, and then, uh, when, so at that point, sort of a few months in, um, we started talking about the exterior of the black hole. Um, and, Kip Thorne had obviously been a part of this film. He, he'd he written the original treatment for the film before Chris Nolan was involved and it was kind of his idea, the film. Um, and so we got on a call with him and at the time it was, it was me, Paul Franklin, and then Oliver James, who was our chief scientist and kind of the, the real sort of overseer of the Black Hole Project. Um, and then we were on the phone with Kip Thorne and we started talking about like, what would it, what would it take to do this um, scientifically accurately? Um, and I've got to be honest, like at the time, I didn't really think that we would, like, I thought that what would happen is that we would write some code that did it scientifically accurately and we'd look at it and we'd get a picture out and the picture would be cool and inspirational. You know, it would have some kind of shape to it and a look. We would look at it and we would use it as reference. And then we'd probably go and do something in Nuke that sort of was inspired by it, but more artistically designed. And that's kind of how I thought it would pan out. And I think everyone at that time kind of thought that's probably fine. And, you know, um, but I think the reason we ended up going so massively into doing it properly, <laughs> scientifically accurately, was that um, was really Oliver James. Um, and, you know, I guess we were all on board with it, right? We were, <laughs> we were all science nerds who wanted to do it. But like Oliver had uh, had a, you know, a background in optics and physics. And he was sort of, he was writing a lot of the code himself and looking after a team to, to, to work on it too. Um, and he was just effectively, you know, getting really into it. So, uh, so he was, he was writing this, this, this code and then, and it would turn into like, could we get texture map support in there? And then we stop and then we're like, that's looking really cool. Could we get support for distant stars in there? And it's like, that's working really well. And then as, as it sort of, there, there came a sort of tipping point where it was like, maybe we can generate all our final images with this, um, which is quite scary. Cause then you're like, we're right. We're writing a, a renderer for this. Right. But like, um, but it, you know, I, the, it's also, there's a point at which you want to do it because it's like, this is, this is really, this is really doing something quite exciting. You know, it's quite, it, it's quite new for a film to be doing something like this. So, so that's, that's how it came about. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, it was, it was, I mean, obviously, really, I, I can't put into words how how kind of honoured and excited I was to do it. I think it it it's a it is it's a very memorable part of my career. <laughs>
how much was the discussion of faking it? Like how much was there uh, like the like the thing where you said like do we keep it going or should we just kind of uh, comp it together or something well, like that? We talked about it. I mean, that's kind of what we did for the wormhole. Um, so the the wormhole at the beginning of the movie uh, is a mix of um, of the wormhole renderer, the scientific accurate one, and then some completely creatively designed um, nuke work for the when when you're traveling through it. Um, and you know, the, the discussion was always that we'll follow scientific accuracy if it looks great and supports the story, but if it doesn't, we won't. And that was always the, the aim. Like it was never, we were never slaves to it. It was always seen as like, let's start with what's real. And if it's, you know, and everyone has to agree, like, I mean, the, the decision is Christopher Nolan's, but you know, if you're looking at it and going, it doesn't look very good, then then we're not going to use that. So the, the the situation with the wormhole was that um, it's it's kind of hard to describe, but um, so the wormhole looks like a sphere, and the sphere is the sort of 360 map of the other galaxy that you're going into. And as you approach it, you know it gets bigger and bigger uh, through your perspective camera. Um, and what actually happens is that it just gets bigger and bigger until it fills your field of view, and now you're through it that's that's how it would look and the and so we we created those renders but the thing is that because of the way it distorts as it grows what it looks exactly like is that you're just zooming in so it just looks like you go you you zoom in and then it's done and you're and you're through the wormhole and the problem with that was it just wasn't very dramatic that like you you had this you had the actors who like the whole ship was shaking and they're like, oh my God. And it's supposed to be this amazing moment of like, you've gone through and you're in this new galaxy. But what it looked like was you zoomed in and then everyone goes, oh, we've arrived. But it's like nothing, nothing happened. You know, it's just visually not very, like it's cool, but it's not, there's no moment of travel in there, you know, visually. Um, so from a storytelling point, that just didn't work. So we, we used the correct renders for the outside of the wormhole. And then when we went through, we did a, a completely crazy design thing where we mapped like the renders of it onto pieces of geometry that we were passing over and things like that, so that we had you know a feeling of travel, and that's completely a whole load of like reprojection in nuke and and you know things like that. But it it was the right decision because it served the story, and and you know we were actually all all on board with that. Like I don't think there was anyone going no, it has to be accurate. Like, um, but with the with the black hole on the other hand it looked amazing from the moment we started creating renders of it. So uh, we we kind of gave up on the idea of designing something in Nuke and just went, we're gonna do this, you know. 